Cust Corner. Cust Corner, it's Cust Corner. Cust Corner, it's Cust Corner. He's got the hottest takes with the highest stakes. He should be president of the United States, but it's Cust Corner, it's Cust Corner. Cust Corner. <laughs> That's not what people have been calling it, thankfully. Uh, well, I mean, if you try to search anything besides Cust Corner, and this is the 28th version of Cust Corner, Tim, then you probably would not have anything else come up in your search. You have to search it that way <clears> or you won't find it. No, well, despite what you're saying, there's a lot of people, there's a groundswell that have, uh, you know, that have opposed that, and I have to say, good for them. Uh, for the, the third member of this edition of Cust Corner, because we recycle through guests, is none other than... Jeff Feinberg, what's going on? Always happy to be here. And it's amazing that Tim could think he's winning a debate <laughs> like this. Because like six people like glad hand him. He's winning a debate to Pat's like 70,000 followers. And the people that are actually calling Tim TC or Top Cat. Or just trolling him. He just says he just likes to live his truth to the point where you know, that doesn't affect him. Just even if it's like mean spirited in his direction, he's choosing to take it as a compliment. No, a lot of people, particularly in like direct messages, will finish them by saying "all the best, TC" or something like that. Well, we are doing this, uh, recording it in advance, because I am likely off on paternity leave at the moment while people are watching this. But it's the first like quarantine edition that we've done of Cuss Corner. So, Jeff, do you have any quarantine-specific things? that We know it's either Tim brings up something, I bring up something. Very rarely do we throw to Jeff. Do you have anything in the canon here that you want to start with? Quarantine, I'm just not in, like, a good place overall. Um, I, like, I, I just don't feel right. Like, I, like, it just everything, just nothing. I don't know. Like, yes, clearly, like, there's, like, a void. But I just don't feel um right by no means like depressed like things are like way too good and i think me and my wife are like killing it like personally as a team on the home front but i i think i'm eating a ton um and and people like can even laugh at what i'm about to say but i think like there's probably video evidence just like the evolution of me like just go look at podcasts um with you but I swear to you, coming out of Florida, I was probably in as good of like a shape at like some of my lowest weight I've been at like since I've known you, Pat. And I literally had a physical like four days after that trip, like right before I think maybe, no, I guess Corona was a couple weeks later. And like, uh, yeah, like I even had a stress test, like on my heart, like I was in a good spot. Um, and I feel like I'm putting weight on, I'm eating a ton, I'm drinking soda. I'm like bored to shit. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. It's like, it's all a blur. It's all a blur. Yeah, I, I can get behind that too. Like, normally I'm pretty regimented in like the, the structure of my day to day and week to week because sports are going on and my job involves doing shows about sports. I know what time I'm going to be at the office every day. I know what time I can go work out every day. I generally have my meals planned like, Hey, I'm going to eat at this time, this time, and this time. And this is what I'm going to eat. I'm a very structured individual. Cause if I'm not, I tend to go completely off the rails. So I've come to sort of a new normal in terms of quarantine in my day to day, but where I am home so much, I'm kind of like you. I'm I'm eating way more than I ever thought I would. And I didn't even intend to eat. Just I'm at home. I'm doing nothing. It's like, yeah, I'm kind of hungry. Might as well go eat something. If I'm at the office and I'm working, then it's not like I'm going to go pop out and get something to eat. So I think that's been the hardest part for me of all of this. But Tim, Paul actually threw out something to me is how long is it going to be before people in public are not distrustful of other people anymore? I don't know. That's a very good question. I hope not long because we cannot live as a society uh, if we see each other first and foremost as vectors of disease and not as, uh, as fellow people. Uh, our society can't sustain that. And because of that, it won't sustain it. Right? That's the old Herb Stein line. Things that can't go on forever will not go on forever. So probably less time than a lot of people think. I am neither a doomer nor am I a, uh, a super positive person in the sense of things are going to get better right away, but I'm certainly not a doomer either. I'm sort of in between. And I think that people will see each other 
you know, suspicious ways for a while, but they'll, they'll get over it because they have to get over it because that's just the way human beings are. They learn to adapt and, and they learn to, to move on. I mean, that's what, I mean, when Darwin writes about evolution, it's not about the strongest surviving. It's not about the fastest surviving. So that's not what, that, what works. The species that survive are those most adaptable to change. That's actually the, the actual point of the origins of the species. And I, I think that's what we're going to see is that people are going to learn how to adapt. It's weird because I don't really go out to many places. I know this is different from city to city, town to town, country to country, no matter where you're watching this, that there are different rules in place. But it does seem like, oh, Jeff, when you go grocery shopping or you go to pick something up at the store, or go get gas, whatever it might be, like the social distancing is one thing people trying to like, it's weird because there, are, you know, there's stuff on the floor when you walk into places like stand on this X, as people have pointed out that if you stand on an X and you're familiar with like Looney Tunes cartoons, like there's going to be an anvil dropped on your head. So I can see why people don't trust that as much unless you have a parasol with you, a mini one. But I find it really weird when people don't get up in my face, but they don't, there, there's like a certain segment of the population just like, whatever, like I'm going to walk right by you. And like, it's not that I care. It's just really jarring at this point. Cause like so few people are actually doing that, that like I was standing in line for groceries. Everyone's kind of like apart, like six feet apart, eight feet apart, whatever. And I was just staying there. Like some person comes up and stands like within half a foot of me. Like that's too close for like normal days. I don't know what the fuck this person's doing. And like, I feel like the asshole. Cause I'm like, like what's really the difference at this point? Like uh, it, it's just a really weird spot to be in. I completely agree. Like I was in, firstly, I'll start off by saying, I think here, I don't know. It could be different everywhere. My interactions out in public. I think everyone seems to be like trying hard, like that. Yeah. Like, I haven't seen anyone, like, blow up or, or freak out, kind of. It does seem like people are trying to be very respectful, uh, for the most part, from what I'm seeing. But I was at, uh, like, we've been doing a lot of takeout. We're not afraid of it. We're not afraid. I know people are still afraid to, like, eat out. We aren't. We're going to support the places around us. Uh, the, like, doomsday scenarios of, like, stores closing and needing to, like, have everything you need in, like, a, a freezer is doesn't really seem like it's going to be like, like ever the case, assuming it doesn't get worse than the peak of, you know, the first uh, paranoia of it. And, uh, you know, people are waiting outside because it's all like counted off at the door, which is, you know, the stores are doing a good job. And I'd argue a lot of these places are probably cleaner than they've ever been now. Uh, these kitchens, these um, parts, uh, I don't know, at the restaurants, I would guess. But one person like in the line as you said, there's kind of like marked spots and like kept getting like two feet from me and I don't really care, but like, it does seem like there's like an overall vibe of people that care. So like you kind of always get closer to me than I would like to take two steps forward and that like increasingly annoyed the person in front of me in line. But I don't know. I, I'm, I don't want to be too, I'm ready to get things going. I'm ready to get things going. I'm a, I make, dumb bets all the time i take risks i don't know there's a part of risk in life well, uh, well it, it's different it's different for us where we live versus where somewhere we're like tim lives because like as we're recording this what do you say there was like one case per day tim yes thankfully yeah and like where we're at just that's not the case whatsoever no but the population you have there is significantly larger and, and you're in the province and the province of course is massive so yeah, but just localized to where we are being in a big city with a condensed sure. population is a bit different than, like, at, at, I think we've seen most of the places that are the most severely impacted are the ones that just have massive condensed populations. Sure, and I think urbanization is, if there's any real consequences from this, I think fewer people are going to be living in cities after this. Uh but, I have a lot of concerns about, they're not so much. Like, concerns, I think we've seen peak city living, put it that way. I, I, I think. Are, know, are with, these downtown like office towers, like that, that commercial office real yeah. estate, like, is it screwed? I don't know that it's screwed. As, as companies try to get some money back or realizing yeah. we're smart to save, they realize, why do we need to pay these exorbitant leases? I can hire you know, you, you've this process will let you show you that you could trust certain employees at home, but even you get bad employees at the office too. So any company is trying to weed out bad employees at home or if they're in the same building. Yeah, I think that's fair. 
and I think there, there's truth to that. I think the idea that we're going to be living in a world of far more teleworking is is a myth. Uh, I, I think that in a lot of ways, it is going to snap back hard. Well, People it, are going to have missed this world, the old world so much that when possible, like I bet you the first season of Major League Baseball, attendance records are going to go through the roof when people can attend again. Uh, there'll be more face-to-face meetings in that first six months than you've ever had before once it's safe to do so. I mean, I think there is a point about line items on budgets that there's going to be reduction in rental space. There's, I, I think there's no question about that. But this idea that we're going to be living in a teleworking, most people working from home uh, world, I, I, I think is fanciful. And I think that's what some people really want it to be. And so they say that. But I, I actually don't see much evidence for that. Well, I mean, if you're going to say on one hand that fewer people are going to be living in cities and peak city living is over, yet people aren't going to be teleworking, I don't see how those two ideas can exist. I, I didn't say people aren't going to be teleworking. There is going to be more teleworking. But the idea that like 60, 70, 80 percent of the workforce is going to get used to being teleworking. I, I, I don't know who you're I arguing think, with well, that, though. Like that, you, that you see, who, oh, who is, oh, no, who is saying this? There are a ton of people who? who are saying that this is the future of work. And I don't know. I Honestly, the thing is, I have no idea. And really, no one has any idea. Uh, one of the things that this has taught me, this whole experience has taught me, uh, and I hope it's taught other people this, is one, you and I have almost no control over our lives in the ways that we think we do. And the second is that the, thing we th- the things we think we know for sure, we know so little about that we should take so in other words it's a it's a it's an effort in you know humility i know a lot less than i thought i knew and my life is a far less in my control which in some ways is liberating if i can't control things then why am i worrying about them why am i stressing about them uh you know some good things from stoic values can come out of this that i really shouldn't be focusing too much on the things i have zero control over and what this thing has taught me is that i have control over very little in my life, because a little thing like this can arise, a virus, and can up in the entire world. And so that's been instructive. And I mean, the reason we're feeling uncomfortable is because we are used to being free and we have had our liberties infringed necessarily. And we hate it. We absolutely despise it, but we know we have to do it anyway. Uh, so that's been instructive too that the reason we've got such malaise is because people actually love their freedom in the sense of what it means. It means being the, the captain of my own ship. Uh, that is what I want to be. And yet I'm not able to do that. And for many of us, I don't know when I can be again. Uh, these are the lessons that I've, that I've learned. I think that if, if you haven't had some serious reasons to doubt the things you thought you, you knew and really check the things you believed, you have not quite understood what this is all about. I have seen, though, to what Tim was referring to, Pat. Um, I don't know whether it was Vice or Vox or one of these like media outlets that are I guess are fringe, but I've seen it around for a while. Wrote like of this whole piece on how like the death of the like office real estate, like the the you know having floors in these high rise downtown towers could be dead. I mean, I can see that. I think the cost of something like that would go way down because I don't, but I mean, it's two distinct things to say, Hey, everyone's going to be teleworking. Therefore they're going to move out of the cities or to say that people won't be coming into the office as much as they did. Like people are still going to own and lease these places. Maybe the demand for them goes down and the price for them goes down. Even I would actually find that hard to believe because there's always people willing to pay some of these prices. But instead of coming into the office five days a week from nine to five, maybe you pick the three days a week you come in, the two days a week you come in, then work the rest of the time from home. If it's been proven to your company that you can ably work from somewhere else, like there's always going to be stuff that you need to do face to face, but maybe it isn't imperative to be there every single day. And if that's the case, because I know a ton of people, like especially where we're at, they commute an hour and a half to two hours to get downtown both ways every single day. Like it only seems like it would increase productivity if you didn't make them allocate 10 hours a week to do that. Maybe. And in some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Not everyone's wired the same way, right? Not everyone's wired that way. Some people are wired to only really be able to work in an office setting. And some people are wired to be more effective in in the environment that they control. 
Some people need to be managed more. Some people need to be managed least, uh, less. Uh, there's no uh, there's no solution to that problem. There's because it's human nature. We're diverse and we're different, and we all have different ways that we need to be dealt with and uh, managed and organized and how we organize ourselves. But if the impact of the virus is a significant curbing on what life, like what city life is like, whether it be the types of restaurants or bars or experiences or plays that you can have, if that has long term effect, people aren't going to pay those exorbitant rates to live in cities because the the value of living in a city has been vitiated. So why in heaven's name would I pay a ton of money to live in a shoebox? If and the reason I'm doing it is because there's so many other fun things. But if I've lost a lot of those fun things, then I would be out of my mind to stay in that city. I would go yeah. elsewhere. Of course Good you point. would. That's, that's, again, that's human nature. Do you think that all of this is your fault when you brought up Fortnite concerts and how ridiculous that was? Now the only <laughs> concert you can go to is a Fortnite concert? <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean jokes on me right i mean i <clears throat> have been to like one concert in five years i'm not a concert guy the next time i'm able to go to a concert i am going i'm one of these people that i will follow the rules for as long as required but when the rules are are, are released i'm going i'm going to i have also learned from this not to stop taking ordinary things for granted because they are not granted uh, nothing is guaranteed to you. Again, it's part of the point I was making that so little in this world is in your control. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go out and do a lot of things I wouldn't usually not do, only because I should be doing because I miss them. It's only in their absence that I realize that I miss them, and I hope a lot of other people uh, do too. Now there will be some people who will be permanently scarred by this, right? You, we have stories of knowing grandparents and great grandparents whose lessons they learned in the Great Depression never went away and they lived the rest of their lives 40 50 60 years in the aftermath of how the depression molded and shaped them there are going to be millions of people i think who are shaped and molded by this experience forever which is why there's no snapping back to a normal but we have no idea what that's going to look like what that's going to mean uh what a reduction in 10 percent of the market share does to almost every bit we, we just don't know and it would be foolish of us to pretend that we do know all that we know is that people are going to decide what they're going to do. Paul, now, I, I've, oh, I, sorry. Go, go ahead, Paul. Paul. I just wanted to know a list of things that Tim deems necessary. What do you mean? Sorry, by necessary. Yeah, I kind of missed the, yeah, it was, it was a question. It doesn't really, I lost the context of it because it was like two minutes ago. <laughs> um, you were, you said that like there's a whole list of things that you deem necessary that you're not able to do. I just wanted to know what those things were. I but, should, if I said necessary, that was the wrong word. There were things that I miss because I wasn't able to do them. I thought they, I didn't think they were necessary for the good. You always thought they were evergreen. Yeah. I didn't realize that for the good life, which is really, you know, the, the purpose of people living society and purpose of polities is the good life. And I just, I realized how much of the things that make a good life. What are the things? Uh, Small walks. Concerts, seeing people, uh, sporting events. Being able to, when I wake up in the morning, decide for the most part what it is I'm, that day is going to look like for me, to have some control over it. And yeah, I mean, as much as, as much as I can. So when I am able to control things more again, I'm going to do it. And I, I think it's necessary for the good life, which is why things can't continue forever because people just simply won't stand for it because human nature won't allow for it. Again, I, I'm very conflicted on this because I think in one sense, it's impossible for things to go on like this much longer. But I'm also certain that it's impossible to open things up uh, very quickly because people won't go to them. So we're, I think we're faced with two impossibilities and I have no idea what will happen. Well, I'll tell you, my kids better be allowed to sleep at their grandparents at like now. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I again, yeah, I, I, I stuff like that is the government didn't control people seeing their grandparents or not. And the government's not going to control when people see their grandparents again. Like people are just going to decide yeah, to no, do it on their own. That is true. And I am sort of in this battle with my wife and like sort of my mom. I, my mom is like ready. She's ready. She wants them. She's ready. You know, and I know Pat's got no sympathy for me because, you know, his, his support systems in airplane away, but I've been accustomed to like every other weekend, a sleepover. It's heartbreaking. And, uh, 
now, now someone, yeah, it's heartbreaking. Yeah, I, hold, 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 hold on, hold on. It, it, it's not so much less heartbreaking as what Jeff is getting at is he has no time off anymore. <laughs> no, no, but yeah, it's heartbreaking and, and for and the grandparents. And I just grandpa. got used to it. Like, like I got used to, like, obviously, we keep the baby, and my wife, my mom would take, you know, the three-year-old, and, and she'd be happy to do it. And, and my kid's thrilled to spend the night with my mom and my dad and the dog and I don't know. We're all just ready. We're all ready for it, but you are right. That is people I'm sure have already done that. That's like an individual decision um, to make when, when people feel comfortable, it's not really a group gathering. No, uh, the government is like Ferris Bueller at that parade, right? When it comes to stuff like this, that it's the parade's already happening. They just well, jump in Doug, front of it and they pretend like they're leading it. Yeah, and I think even the premier here in Ontario kind of alluded to, like, I don't know, like, I'm seeing my parent, or his mom might have passed, but he's like, I don't know, I got two other kids, I think I've yeah. seen them, and then he kind of caught himself by not wanting to, but, uh, you know, fully break down what sort of social distancing rules he may or may not have breached, but I, I agree. So, like... My son is seeing his grandparents and great grandparents more now than he probably ever would have outside of this ever happening because we FaceTime them in or Skype them in basically every single day. And that's something that we would do maybe once a month before. And that's a great positive externality from this. It is. But there's, but a, great many, there's a great many people for whom the opposite is true, right? And for whom Tim- artifi- artificial uh, communications just simply is, isn't sufficient. And for those people... Your, your heart has to break. Mine does. I think of all these poor people in retirement homes who can't see right. their families yeah, and, and who can't go visit people in retirement homes who might never see them if they get sick again. Uh, if, if that doesn't make you want to cry, I, I don't know how you have a soul. Uh, it, it's absolutely just heartbreaking. And this stuff is going on in so many other ways that we're not even thinking about that are crushing, which is why you are not able to properly mourn a family member's death. There could be long lasting, like residual impact from, from that. And what's hard and the hard thing is there's nothing you can do about it. It's that complete lack of control. I mean, the lesson learned is you and I have so little control over our lives that we maybe need to just realize, okay, this is what the Stoics have been teaching for 2000 years. Most of the things in this world you can't control in the least. You shouldn't be getting yourself emotionally involved in any single thing at all. Anything that could be taken from you or could go away doesn't deserve the whole of your emotional control. You have to learn to just realize that I can only control these little things and the rest are, are just going to come and they're going to go. And So why did we spend all that time getting worked up over an NFL schedule? Because it is very, it's next to impossible <laughs> to live those truths. And we get upset because we are craving normalcy. Uh, I'm craving it. You're craving it. Those are the things I want to be upset and worked up about. Uh, I, I also, it's all, very, it's all very distressing stuff. And people if, won't if, come back from it. I like, um, this nope. might be an extreme scenario. You know, he's also like ultra rich and could have five houses and, and live a better life than never having to return to, to Manhattan. But I, I've brought up Howard Stern a bunch over the years on this show and recently, but uh, like, I don't know, the end of him might be just like at home in his basement doing that show. Like that's how he's going to go out because he's never stepped. He, he's pretty much alluded to might need to be like two years before he dares steps foot in Manhattan again. Like he's now, people a, he's say stuff like, but on the flip side, people say things like that because it's easy to say but not actually true. You like just like professional athletes who say I'm not playing in until there's a vaccine. Well, there may never be a vaccine. We can't be guaranteed to that. So you can't go around saying things like that because it, it, it well, you can go around saying things like that, I suppose, but you shouldn't because a, you don't know what's going to happen and B, you don't know that you actually mean it. And so it may be the case that he's not comfortable in two years, but it may very well be the case that in six months from now, the think of what life was like six months ago from now, fr- go from now till now you think you have the slightest idea what six months from now looks like, uh, you are a visionary. And uh, I, I doubt that you are. Well, do, do you find it strange that, I mean, I, I'm shockingly enough that you and I, it seems like the three of us all agree on this, but there's a lot of not only online victory lap people about stuff that happens like day to day, but like, no, 
here's how it's going to be if you think differently, like, you're basically a moron. Like, I find it, that's such an absurd stance to take, and I see the people I know making these things. Like, it's just, it's really bizarre to me. They have no control over their own lives, so this is a way they can assert some sort of control in the world by asserting themselves as experts on this thing and take a glee in it. Like that, that sort of a nasty smile about, oh, well, you'll never see your grandparents again. Like those people, like that's how they, that's how they find a way to grapple with the loss that they have in the world. Uh, and for whom I have great sympathy for too. It's like, it's less about that type of person. And, and I, Jeff, Jeff, I think I know, you, you know, like the sorts of people that I'm talking about. Like I have no problem with people. Listen, we tout golf picks that are generally losers, that kind of thing. And when golf comes back, we're going to do exactly the same thing. We talk about football. It's going to be that sort of thing too. But like, I see like stock people are really bad at this. Like stock people have basically become Bitcoin people at this point oh, yeah. in terms of like their weird victory laps, like all the time and all that, I, to me, like when I read that sort of stuff, it just shows like, oh, like you have nothing going on uh, and you have too much money to know what you're doing with. And like most people are not in that bucket. Like 95 percent of people are in the other bucket. Like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah. Um, listen, I'm not. I completely agree with what you're saying. And if you have that kind of money to like be taking victory laps on like day trades, I don't know. Good good for you. I certainly don't at the moment, especially in these times, but um, I see what you are seeing and I'm not surprised by this, but it's very common. There's a lot of people, uh, listen, I'll make wrong statements all the time, but I'll say them confidently. And there's things I like to talk about, like you said, like golf, like football, but I, I think, you know, there's a big, I don't pretend to be an expert at things I don't know. Well, I guess people are laughing at that, but I know I don't know this stuff and how the world will look. So I don't have any clue and I completely stay out, stay out of it and don't get into any of it, whether it be stock tips or lizard people. Yeah, well, it... <laughs> I mean, I mean, that's people. one of those things where when you know, you know, as it's been explained <laughs> to me, but like whether it's even the stock stuff, like as most stock people will tell you, like the stock market is highly unpredictable anyway. Like if you can make a buck on it, that's awesome. It's just the weird victory lapping about it, whether it's up or down seems strange. It's like all the people Tim, that overnight became coronavirus experts. Like, really? Like, th this is the lane that you've chosen to take? Yeah, it I would advise people not to go on r slash coronavirus. There's nothing healthy there. <laughs> really? Uh, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of people who are, it, 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 surprisingly, it's just mostly doom sayers uh, and people who are just uh, armchair experts who think it's their God-given right to know everything about a thing they'd never heard of before four months ago. So like that bothers me a lot. But then I read things like, for example, this morning, the one of the counselors in Los Angeles said they expect their stay at home lockdowns to last for at least three more months. No, no, they're not. They're not going to last for three more months either. That isn't an option. So like I'm torn uh, between people saying, Oh, well we just, it, with certainty, the uh, stay at home orders will be in place for a very, very long. They're not going to be. People are just simply not going to put up with that. And at the same time, how could they not be? Because this is not going to go away. So what I mean, we're, we're constantly faced with impossibilities and people don't know how to cope with that. People have no idea how to cope with the fact that the world around them is impinging on them in a million ways and they don't understand it and they can't do anything about it. And it's just, you know, and, and, and logical impossibilities are striking them at every turn. And I feel like we sort of alluded, well, no surprise, but when this sort of all began, sort of like, okay, you're asking us to shelter, to quarantine, I'm going to be a good sport. I'm prepared to be a team player, but we're all going to have our breaking points. We're like, I'm not playing for the team anymore. Like, I don't give a shit. I got to get this done and I'm going to get it done for me and my family. That's it. Yeah. You, you need some plate appearances so you can get a few more home runs and juice up your next contract. Yeah. I mean, it, you want to be the closer because saves get paid in baseball more than the guy who pitches the eighth inning. Like it, you start thinking about it selfishly for yourself at a certain point. Yeah, absolutely. But you also feel like you're allowed to because party will be like, I don't know. I was a team player for, for, for 10 weeks. I did everything they asked me to do. And if you're staying home and behaving yourself and a ton of other people aren't, 
then aren't you a fool? In some ways, like, why would I allow myself to be self-quarantined uh, when the whole world is doing other things? Like, 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 that stuff affects you as well. It has to. I feel like the people who don't leave at all are, they just, yeah, they're not, they're, they're terrified a lot of the times to leave. I feel like the people, I can't... the people who, you know, they're trying to be as safe as possible. But they're going to still go out and jerk. do some stuff. Um, I feel yeah, like-, like I've been going out frequently. You're- it's a good point, Paul. Like, I'm not one of these people who's afraid to go out. And I don't understand. Unless you're immunocompromised or, or with somebody who's immunocompromised. I don't understand staying inside, you know, 23 hours a day. I get out every day for a walk, go to the grocery store a couple times a week. I go for a drive when it's sunny. I always social distance. I play by the rules. But like these people are like, oh, I haven't left my house in four weeks. Like. I think that's alien. Madness. That is not. That's not a healthy alien approach. I, yeah, and I don't. I get glad hand those mm-hmm. people. I don't glad hand those people in my inner circle. Um, like I, I've kind of maybe went over the line in harassing my friend who's like too afraid to get a pizza. But I think that's like insane, and I'm so confident that these pizza places, and like I was saying before, any places. I feel like they're actually cleaning exponentially more than they would before. Definitely. Oh, I yeah. think they're so I think they're cleaner. Um so I don't know that that person is bothering me more so than like any. And uh, maybe it's I like what what do I care about? It's like dude, like come on. Like you're embarrassing yourself, man. Well, you, like, you it seems like you care about this person on a personal level to make their the, the, like if you're someone who's staying inside like 24 hours a day and like you haven't left your house unless you like you're actually quarantining from getting over the virus or you think you may have been exposed by the virus, I get that, but your two weeks are up, you don't have it, then you can kind of go on with not obviously your regular life because no one's really doing that, but I'm kind of like Tim, like I, I haven't stopped going like I don't go to the grocery store as much as I used to if i go i try to knock it out all in once maybe i go once a week once every two weeks and i try to order as much stuff online as possible but like i'm going out and you know i take my son for a walk every day i'll go outside and i'll go for a run not every day because you know i'm not in immaculate shape like i was before this started but had i been running every day if i had the gumption to do that but i think that there's a malaise that sets in too like the being at home all the time it's just kind of self-perpetuating that you get into this habit like like I talked about the habits before, like I was on a good habit, highly productive, highly efficient. I got so much done during the day, uh, every day, whether that be a weekend, whether that be a weekday, I knew what I had to do. I mapped out what I wanted to do. And when you're at home, like you get lazy, you, it's not necessarily like slipping into depression or anything like that. Like there's a huge difference from being depressed and being like sad about your surroundings because of what's going on. In a fog. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you one thing I'm really worried about is when it's starting to happen already, but when more and more stores and places open up, there will be a attitude of things are beginning to open up. Don't you dare go to them. Parks are now available for you to, to use. Don't you dare go though. Yeah, but I Look don't. I, I, I don't. I don't mind that sentiment at the very I beginning do. because the, like no, because the one thing that you did, I get, the, I get your side of it, and I actually agree with it. But I think that the one thing that people need to caution of when stuff first opens up again, like when, when we walk around town now, like even before any of this stuff is lifted, on the first nice day, the park was so packed. Like people just like basically like sardine cans in there. That that's the stuff that I would think that you would want to try to avoid right away. Like you'd want a reintegration and sure, but people but people, people aren't gonna go and follow the rules anymore. Like that's just not people don't follow the rules with the stuff going on. Once stuff opens up a little bit, saying like, hey, you need to stay in six feet apart of people who like you don't know kind of thing. Like maybe if that's the new ease of restrictions, people just aren't gonna follow that. And then you risk it, I guess. Right. But these new rules are only enforceable by individuals. There's no overarching force that can really enforce these things. And uh, I don't think that becoming a snitch culture is healthy. And so I, I don't know, like, yeah, if it's a sunny day, people have nowhere to go. They're going to go to the few places that they can go. And if they're open, there is nothing healthy in a society of people just pointing the finger and saying, how dare you go to this place that's open like that? I, you should you know, do everything you can to social distance. You should do everything you can to follow the rules. But don't just i don't know you, you see what i'm saying like there, there yeah, is a, but, but there's but a what, line here and but, people are crossing it already but what i'm with 
what I'm saying is that I don't think that people are necessarily going to snitch on other people for going out, but I can see people's hesitation to jump right back into it. It like, happens every day. How many people, when people went to the beaches in Florida, said, look at all these people here, not social distancing, even when, you know, weeks later, Florida didn't have an eruption. Uh, Georgia isn't having an eruption. Hey, people, hey this isn't coming out for three weeks. This isn't coming out for three weeks. Pal. Okay. Well, after the two week inc incubation period, and in Florida's case, a four week incubation period on the beaches, that, that didn't happen. Why? Because people like were thinking, if I can't do it, you can't do it. And we're just really, I don't know. There's something, I saw this online and I, you saw, I saw it a lot of places that people were almost sort of rooting for failure. I agree with you. I agree with you. You're seeing that for sure. You're seeing all the people that, for like, when they first put out those, like, modeling curves, like, oh, X amount of people are going to die, and it's super highly inflated. Now, that might have just been a scare tactic to, to get people to stay at home, for one thing, and that was a lot of those early models that came out were, if we do nothing, if we just continue life as it is, this is what we project. And obviously, life didn't continue that way. Stuff changed immediately, so obviously it was going to curb a little bit. But yeah, there are people rooting for this to be bad, whether it be, well, I want the president to be wrong. I want him to look as badly as possible. That None of that shit should matter. What should matter is that people are going to be okay and go through it all. But I think that there's a huge discrepancy, Tim, between what you read online and people's comments on Twitter or Reddit or whatever and how people actually feel in real life about this. I agree. But the people who are in control of the national conversations happen to have an outsized role on the platforms you just mentioned. Yeah, but it's so few people actually use these mediums. It's just everyone you know uses these mediums. Maybe. Here's sure. But like, what happens? Sorry. Go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead. No, because I was going to just go a little sideways. So if you're directly countering this. No, no, I, I'm not. I'm just saying like what what percentage of the like North American population is actually on Twitter? Like 7%? Yeah, but yeah. That, and that's true. But I mean, people are like consuming more news than they did six months ago. I don't know, probably 80% of people are consuming more news than they used to do because they have a lot more time on their hands. Maybe. I'm actually consuming less news than usual. Yes, but because you and like, I are weirdos. We consumed way too much news to begin with. Sure. The average nine to fiver who but didn't I would, news we did, he consumes it a lot more. But the guy who's afraid to go get a pizza is the guy that's watching like the three daily press conferences from local yes. and he from already federal was. and from provincial governments. Like, yes. like daily still. So that's all um, part of it. My question is, you know, obviously this was all done to to keep the hospitals from getting overwhelmed. And we've, you know, to a certain extent we've done, we've curved, even if there have been deaths, because there has been a level of curve that existing without any social distancing practices. But why won't the hospitals get overwhelmed when we come back out there? No, that's like, the, that, the thought, well, that, that that's the new level of fear that people are now living under. Is that or it's like in June, if your last name is from A to, to I don't know what's letter thirteen, you know, I mean, to, you got you can go out in June, and then from July, it's the second half of the alphabet. Like I don't know what, what's the plan. Well, I think that a lot of it had to do with the initial concern about places being overwhelmed. Hospitals it wasn't just because there weren't enough hospital rooms for people; it's that there wasn't enough equipment for people for what they had projected. But it does seem like most places have caught up to the potential oh, like yeah. top end need because of the intervening four months. Like the quarantine, yes. the quarantine and the social distancing did seem to work in flattening the curve. And like they said that it would do and it hasn't happened anywhere. Like I was looking at the latest like curvatures for all these different countries, like Canada and the US are both still like at some of the highest risk in the world versus a lot of these other places because it didn't stick here as much as uh, like the actual practice of quarantining and sticking to it. Like the outbreaks that we get are weirdly clustered. Uh, and of a course, lot of it were massive countries that are federations that where central power doesn't exist. Right. It is, but we're I, unlike but most I, countries are not federations. They don't have provinces or States that have a ton of uh, independent authority. Uh, we're very United States and Canada are very rare like that. There's not a lot of places on earth like it. And we also are geographically so massive that it, and, it's very difficult to do the sort of things that South Korea can do or that, uh, that Hong Kong can do. It's just, it, it's not that we have different values. It's just that certain things just aren't possible. That's why. But, but so essentially quarantining, and obviously I, I should be aware of this is essentially done 
So when we do get out and have the outbreak, the hospitals have now stocked up and they're ready for the mass yeah. um, input that's about to hit them when we're all allowed back. Yeah, this was never about getting rid of the virus. It was about flattening the curve so that the hospitals will be ready. And one of the concerns that I have is that there almost seems like there's a bit of a bait and switch between we were actually always just wanted to control the virus, not the curve. And people yes. aren't dumb. People will know if you have been lying to them. They are not going to sit here and go, oh, well, that's right. That's what we originally all uh, bargained with in March. If you're saying, well, actually, no, we did the thing we all agreed we were going to do. But what we really meant was this other thing. Thank well, you, like Tim. that's changing the terms of the debate. And that even if those terms should be changed, because that would be good. It is very, very dangerous to do that with free peoples and free societies who will know that that is not what they agreed to initially. Uh, and that's not how social contracts work. Even when you get the information, you look at it, you're like, I'm sure there's shit like this that pops up all the time and people ignore it. And it yeah, should I, mean, be I, do think like, that, I do think that the CCP bear a little bit more responsibility than anybody else. Sure. But like, what are you going to do about that? Honestly, like I, 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 remember, I, I remember when I first started this, I had a guest on and she said, like, you know, we need to get retribution from China. It's like, good fucking luck with that. Who's going to help? Like, yeah, I don't know. How do you I, actually hold them accountable? I, I have no idea. I really don't know. I think the answer is you can't. Well, it's not that you can't. It's that would the cost be worth it? And maybe the answer is no to that. All right. I got a deer but, cut. This this has been a bit too serious for Cuss Corner. I got a deer cut. It has play. been. We should do some nonsense to lighten things. It's like when I listen to the sad songs. I do it so that I get even more excited when the happy songs come. You on. realize that show would have come out like a month ago. Exactly. And I know that our listeners are close listeners and know the <laughs> reference. because I trust them. <laughs> you just you totally forgot. And you thought it was the same show. You don't know what I know. Dear Custy, this comes from Daniel. I'm a big fan of movies and the whole movie-going experience. The discussions between you, Pat, and Jeff inspired me to try to involve my girlfriend in the movie-going experience. She has the DFL movie take of all time. She prefers watching a YouTube synopsis of the movie. She is the perfect example <laughs> of a millennial destroying the movie industry. Can you please talk sense into this woman? Save me, Top Cat. Dan. Well, Dan, uh, listen, the only reason these synopsises are, synopses, sorry, are possible is because filmmakers are going out there and making the film. Why read the book? There's just a movie adaptation. It's the same approach. Uh, explain to her, though, that she's not getting the full, rich experience of watching a movie when you watch the synopsis. I don't watch a movie just to see how the plot goes from point A to point B to point C, but I want to see everything that's up. Like it's, it's, an, it's a visual and sensual experience, right? You experience with your senses, your sound, your sight, your, your I guess just really those two. You experience the movie uh, in, in, that, in that sense. And so when you just watch a synopsis, yeah, you know what the movie's about. It's like the people who in high school would read cliff notes on Romeo and Juliet so they could pass the test. No, now no, 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 no. That, that's yes, that's a different. The, no, that's they a, can pass that's the a test. different situation. They know what happened, but no. they didn't really read Shakespeare. I, I get that point, but that's a completely different situation. You read the cliff notes to pass a test. There's no test involved with this. There's sure, but it, but if the goal is to just know what the movie was about, which is what watching those synopses are all about, then sure, but that's not. That's mistaking what the point of movie watching is, which is to sort of take on for a couple of hours to suspend the world you're in and to enter into the mind and memories and experiences of uh, of the filmmaker. And you do yourself a disservice when you you cut to the you just short circuit that experience. So that's how I would explain it to her because she's mistaken. Yeah, I find it really crazy that that. Why, why even like if that if that's all you were going to do to watch a YouTube synopsis of it, why wouldn't you just go to like IMDb and re read like the three lines about what the movie is? And it's about? weird because a lot of millennials these days are doing the opposite, right? When the trailer for a movie comes out, they, you know, spend six hours breaking down every single frame in it to like really blow it out. So I'm not used to the, you. I'm you used really to... think that like the very niche end of the Internet represents all people, don't you? This is what I am. This is what I encounter. This is you, what I oh, see. you're going to say this is how the truth that you live, isn't it? No, I didn't say that, and I wouldn't have said. It. I'm just saying. I think that there's a lot more of these hipster millennials spending time breaking down every frame of what's on TV rather than like condensing everything into two minutes. That's all. 
What would you think, Jeff? Do you think that more people are do you th- how the frame by frame culture and people consuming it? Do you think that's a super high majority of people? No. No, the answer is no. No. Well, I'm t- happy to be on on the right side. I I don't know, man. The move the movies as a whole are, are this has been another debate in and of itself uh within the movie industry. Um, because there was an amazing release of the Trolls 2 movie that was so such a video on demand hit that uh, they, they, they almost said that even after this, they're going to have some straight to VOD. And then theater chains started to say, if you do that, we're going to boycott all your movies. Wait, what? Say that again? I don't know if you saw these stories, but a couple weeks ago, the Trolls 2 movie like did over 100 million like on video on demand release, like on on its first weekend during the quarantine. It was such a massive success for them. We could debate it. I think it's more of a kid because it's a kid's movie. I could see why kids movies VOD would be such a greater commodity. But uh, Universal Pictures went out and said that they might use this like regularly going forward. They were so impressed. And then AMC Theater shot back and said, If you go right to VOD, video on demand, we will not put anything in the theaters. Like you can't play both sides here is sort of what AMC was threatening Universal with. And it was just over conjecture, over reports that Universal uh, might do this. AMC felt that they had, um, it was in their vested interest to publicly throw a shot saying, do not do that or your pictures will not be in our theaters, period. I can tell you though, some, some, like I would never watch Tenet for the first time on my TV or to uh, no time to die on my TV first that I need to see as the filmmakers intended and heaven forbid if I can't watch that. Yeah. I mean, what what would happen? Would you just say that it's over? I can't watch a uh, Tenet and 70 mil IMAX and therefore like it's just, that's just the over. way it needs to be watched. Because some people, I, I'm sure that's the prefer. Like, I'm sure that is the pre- people, listen. I would prefer to watch it that way as well. It was like 1917. I went to the theater to watch 1917 because I thought that was a movie that I should watch on the big screen with the sound because that's how it was going to be made. But AMC has to come out and say that to Universal, or they're, they're going to go out of business. Oh yeah, of course, of course they do. Of course they do. It's an empty threat, but they have to say it anyway. But like the VOD thing, like I think it works for some things. I think it works for other things. People like going to the movies. I don't think that's going to go away. It might get scaled back a little bit, but we've seen that just over the past 10 years anyway. The box office isn't as big as it was 10 years ago. And these opening weekends for certain movies, sure, but the overall box office is down, at least in North America. But I think that some people are conflating quarantine numbers with actual numbers, though. So like Tiger King. For example, if the quarantine isn't going on, I bet you no one really cares about Tiger King. The Michael Jordan documentary series, that it would be a big deal, but it wouldn't be like it was because no one has no one has anything else to watch. So if a kid's movie comes out, A, people have their kids at home and they need something to distract them, as Jeff was kind of alluding to, that maybe more kids movies end up being shown at home because that's just easier for parents. I agree with all that. Like Disney Plus decides to release like some of their Disney movies, although those are particularly the ones that are released for the big screen. But maybe there's another niche market of these kids movies that they just release on Disney Plus and they do just as good. Sure. I don't even think Disney Plus, though, because they'd have to get some of like the hot money for I mean, you could have the Disney Plus specials, but. Uh, Even if Disney went this route with new releases for kids movies, I still think it goes to like VOD for that like premium price up if people want to buy it like hot. That yeah. makes any sense. No, no, I, I get that. I get that a lot. But like maybe the compromise is the VOD costs more than going to the theater. Maybe that's a way to entice people to go to the theater. That if Maybe, was- but if, if you got three kids and two of them really want to watch it and one of them's a little young, I don't know, it's worth it paying a few extra, extra bucks. I, I don't know. I could just, I don't understand why Universal is was talking so publicly about such a success um, and potentially changing its format over a kid's movie is all I'm, I'm saying. I don't think that kind of proves a ton uh, kids movie in quarantine doing fantastic in a VOD straight to VOD. 
I don't think that proves a lot. No, I, I just think that case testing anything during with what's going on right now is not going to give you accurate results. It's like everyone who wants like whatever new testing or whatever new drugs that are coming or to treat like the virus, like, oh, good, you have a two week sample with 12 people. Like, that's not science. Like, you, you need a bigger sample than that. You need time to figure out if this stuff is true, but everyone just wants it to be done right now. That I think that goes beyond, like, that's just how testing has to work in general. So if you're testing drugs on a certain test case, that's one thing. If you're testing a, a market sample size of VOD products based on a very isolated incident, which you don't expect to continue six months from now, or at least society will be different, their consuming habits will be different, I don't really know what that's telling you. And some filmmakers would just never tolerate VOD to begin with. I mean, they also, might. I mean, some. You'd be surprised that you know not every filmmaker is the the artiste that they claim to be. They're going to start doing where the money ends up going. And if movies aren't being shown in theaters, chances are they're probably not going to make a whole bunch of movies for theaters. If movies can't be shown in theaters, movies can't get physically made. Then, right? That's, How do you make them? How do you, yeah. if, you if it's if things are so bad in eight months that we can't go see movies in theaters? The idea of making movies becomes just for insurance reasons becomes an impossibility. No, because so, look at look at how much content is being produced by streaming services and movies that will never end up going to the movie theater as it is. Like if you make if you if you make if you make if you make a Netflix movie, that's not going to be shown in theaters, and you get if it, no. But I think he's talking lot. about he's talking I about the ability to actually produce like have them shoot the scenes. Yeah, then you go shoot your movie in like Columbia or something. It's not going to happen, right? That's my point. It's just not going to happen. That's why Tim was, I don't know whether it was during one of our previous shows or off air that he's crying because all productions are delayed, that he's worried about next year's like, How what? am I going to see this sweet. as us next year? There's no way I'm going to see this as us. They left in a big company. <laughs> I don't even know what happened. I'm not going to get a chance to know what happens because that probably won't come back for two years. And if it doesn't come back for two years, well, then all the people who are a certain age have grown too old and we'll lose that plot line. Don't you think that doesn't bother me? I've spent four years of my life invested in that show. And many of us have in all these various network TV shows. They're just not going to come back because filming probably starts in like a month or two months from now for the fall. And that's not going to be able to happen. And so what am I going to do? I can't even watch my network shows. Dave just got renewed for season two. What, what did? did? Dave? Oh, did it? Yeah. yeah. You're, you're big on Dave, aren't you? I'm into it. There's a lot of like, I can laugh at. I see some of my friends and I, I just see some things there. Like I, I like uh, the blackfish fan, like put me on the floor. We, Tim and I have met some fish fans in our time. <laughs> oh, have we ever <laughs> it's... had a fish event at a, a, con, at a, a festival where fish played? They played two shows during that festival. Like that, Each... ho that whole culture. I, I just, I, it's the same as like the grateful dead cultures. Like these people, tore with them from place to place and like peddle their wares out of like old VW bugs. I like, I, I just, that, that whole, that just blows my mind. Like, I, I don't, that's get that. the life they want. Okay. I know a guy who had, this is, this is a really good friend of one of my good friends. So that's like kind of an acquaintance for sure. Um, and his parents, like very successful parents could do anything. I'm sure they're devastated with what he does. But this guy literally like drives around like uh, selling like hummus, paying like at these fish shows to like pay to keep going to fish shows. It's it's fucking disturbing. If that's the one thing in your life that you <laughs> want to do, he's doing it. <laughs> like I don't feel passionately about anything in my life that I would want to commit everything to it. Do you? No. Like if, like if someone said during the course of the NFL season that you had no other responsibilities, you didn't have kids, didn't have a job, your job was to follow around the Chargers from place to place, you would probably take that, wouldn't you? That would be cool. I think like as an adult, like literally following around the PGA Tour would be cool, but that would be boring. Like golf spectator, like I go to one event like a year and that's like more than enough unless I'm going to be at like the Masters. That's obviously different. But no, I wouldn't. But if you told me like I could travel, I was part of the team traveling party for the year, that would be different. Like I'm on the sidelines for games. I have locker room access. But no, just to be like a fan taking a, a like flying commercial in and out of games and paying like doing my own thing. No, that's not appealing at all. 
Yeah, I can't think of a single thing that I would care enough about outside of, like, my family that I would want to go do that. Like, it would just get boring, wouldn't it, Tim? I'm the type of person that it takes a lot to get bored. So, no. I think, I, you know, if I could follow around the Jets for an entire season, uh, that might be fun for ones. I wouldn't want to do the rest of my life, but if you told me for one season, four months, go travel every game, go to every single game, sort of be a roadie for the team or whatever. Ah, you know what? I'd never do it again. So why not? That 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 would be fun. Or like go to every single home game uh, for a baseball team uh, that one particular season. That would be kind of neat. Sure, but uh, it, you only, but the people you only that, want to do it once. But yeah, yeah, but the people that we met, whether it be like we didn't, we met the fish heads. We didn't meet the dead yes, heads. But, but their it, brains it, were fried. It seems like when you're into this, this is now your lifestyle. It's not like yeah. I did it. I followed around fish for a summer. I'm done. No, like this is your career now. <laughs> yeah, I yeah, don't that's get right. It. I don't get it, and I don't get them. And it's like they'll play like forty minute musical interludes. Like, oh yeah, their songs three go three words. Two hours. Like it's so. Weird. And trust me, I yeah, I know. Oh my god. And me and my friends will make fun of our friends who like it, and like they'll go on these like Reddit boards or like there's this uh, like Google Doc. Like every time they play a song, like it's inputted. It's like, did you see what they played? Like <laughs> holy shit. <laughs> Like, oh, oh, my God. Um, every Jewish guy knows one or two guys that, like, are fish obsessed. I can't. I don't get it. I don't get it. Never got No, there are no Dave Never Matthews. I spent my adolescence enjoying Dave Matthews <laughs> and can look back and laugh at myself <laughs> now. We'll say that. I, I will say, I think we've brought this up before, but the only people that I know that like Dave Matthews at this point are like 27 year old Jewish dudes. That's it. It's not all of them, that, but like if I do see, demo. if I do see people like go into my 38th Dave Matthews concert, I can assure you that they're all Jewish. Uh, 100%. Uh, but man, Dave. What, what, but I guess my question is why is Dave Matthews Jewish? Like, I don't get it. What's that? I don't, he I'll just, effort that. I don't know how to explain it, but he just hit a he just hit a chord with us like uh, summer camp Jews. Like you have no like I'd go to Jewish summer camp, Pat, and the flock, like the bus is rounding out that place is like Dave is playing the Molson Amphitheater here in Toronto. Um in and in oh god. I remember going to a Dave show in the middle of an NFL draft once, and then the Leafs swept the Islanders the next day. Same building. What a, what a, what a, what a, what a little mix. Dave the draft was on a Saturday. Dave Back Matthews. Good days, yeah. Dave Matthews is of African American and Jewish descent. Like Lenny Kravitz. He doesn't, I don't, I don't see. He plays, he plays it up too. Like, I don't know what he's doing, but there's something that he's like, um, hypnotizing us he, like he, he immigrated dude. to israel one time too i think in the 90s i saw a story about yeah i i, I just i never got, i brand. thought maybe you could share some insight to that because i just never understood it because like dave Matthews i don't really sucks. have <laughs> i don't really have an insight why but i know it's everything you th you're perceiving is is absolutely true it's absolutely true I don't, I don't know what sort of brainwashing he's able to do to young Jews, but it's happened. Yeah. I don't know if it's gotten the next generation. My generation, for sure. Like, I got swept up in it. Oh, my God. I, I'm embarrassed. Okay. Like, is, is it male and female, or is it just male? Primarily male, but also incredibly popular um, with the females. Yeah. yeah. All right. I wanted to bring this one up because I've been – obsessing over it for some time and i just find it funny every single time i look at it tim i shared with you the new versions of monopoly yes so there's miss monopoly there's millennial monopoly there's socialist monopoly that one's actually a parody game which people on the internet get very triggered about but miss monopoly is the craziest thing in the world yeah i don't know what i guess they're trying to virtue signal it, no, it, like all these versions of the game are clearly like 
three old white dudes at Hasbro were like, you know how we can hit a different demographic? We'll make Miss Monopoly and just make it like the worst thing ever that's insulting to everyone. Like, in, in oh, Mi- but she has a new hat. Yeah, basically. Like, in Miss Monopoly, <laughs> when you pass Go, uh, if you're a female player, you get $240 instead of the $200 that a man would get for playing the game. Now, if these want to be the rules to your game, that's fine. That just seems like a really weird thing to put in a game. That's not healthy. That's not you help. Like Monopoly is already cutthroat and nasty enough to like impose upon it, like further, I don't know, socio-political considerations. I don't know. I, I, I don't, I don't go in for that. Yeah. So in the company, the statement made by the company said, it's a fun new take on a game that creates a world where women have an advantage often enjoyed by men. But don't worry, if men play their cards right, they can make more money too. I get the like the sentiment behind that. I see what it's trying yes, to do. You know, when I play board games, there's nothing I want to do more than to encounter being taught social lessons from my moral betters at Hasbro. Uh, that that's really what I am looking for when I play a board game with friends or family on a Saturday evening. And I, I'm so grateful that that opportunity has been afforded to me. So Hasbro is taking over the world, man. They're spending billions on like Peppa. They they bought up so much kids content. It's incredible. Oh, they own Peppa Pig. They bought it for like billion. Yeah. That Ooh, I believe else. is banned in China. Peppa Pig. Uh, they do not care for Peppa Pig. What? Not banned in this the, the government, the government, because uh, apparently she's immoral for, I don't know. I don't watch the show. I know the Chinese government at least has strong takes against Peppa Pig. I thought that was, (laughs) I thought that was China bans Peppa Pig because let's see here. This is from the independent. Uh, China bans Peppa Pig because she quote promotes gangster attitude. (laughs) I never got that. Not going to lie to you. Did not get that from uh, when my son watches Peppa Pig. And we get it. It's a very popular show here. I've never gotten like gangster attitude from 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 Lily. No, so, and it's, it's just like, hello, I'm Peppa Pig. Hello, Mrs. Yeah. Orse. How are you today? Like that's the entire know. It show. Sounds like a low rent version of Babar. Maybe kids just like <laughs> Babar instead. No, Tim. It's too rich. Tim is his king elephant. Yeah. Oh, I liked Babar. Don't worry about your pleb cartoon shows for the children. You need to talk about King Babar. That was a great show, and I will defend it. I think it's probably more wholesome than 95% of what's out there these days. I was into Babar. Thank you. Of course you were. It was on TV. We never have a choice of being into things or not. It's There's true. only like six things on TV, so it's that's true. what we watched. <laughs> All I'll say about this Miss Monopoly thing, though, is just go to Twitter and type Miss Monopoly into the search bar and just read the top comments because it is fucking hilarious. Like the, Oh, the, yeah, there are people for the, whom I'm sure. No, 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 no. I just mean the amount of jokes about this are very good. <laughs> I'm sure there are. And they're coming from, like, it's one of the few ubiquitous things that both the left wing and the right wing both have a problem with, that it's, everyone's just kind of converging in the middle and making fun of this one thing. It's perfect. It's oh, really, it's, that. It, Miss Monopoly, bringing people together. But there's also other ones. Like, you can have, you can play, min, like, so the same people that created Ms. Monopoly for the advancement of feminism through Monopoly, uh, probably the poor choice, like Tim pointed out, uh, that there's Monopoly Socialism, which is a parody game, but there's also like a real Monopoly for millennials, and it sounds like if Tim made the rules. I swear to God. So it's the same people that applied their, like, their idea of feminism onto Monopoly, applied their idea of millennials onto it, which is, Tim, your stance on millennials. Would you like to hear about the rules? I'm all ears. Jeff, uh, to tell me if this sounds like something that Tim would uh, come up with. Uh, they've decided to, quote, give you a break from the rat race because it's not all about money, Jeff. Uh, this game is jam-packed with uh, millennial stereotypes like Penny Bags standing in front of a vegan restaurant and he's wearing blue Ray-Bans and earbuds and carrying a coffee to-go cup. Um, that's exactly what they would be doing, too. <laughs> That's how Same they. That's how millennials live their lives. That's a fact. You're a millennial. No, but okay, but the millennials who engage in millennial cult. I guess no one can see me doing the finger quote thing. Millennial culture. Mm-hmm. Uh, that that that's them. That's who they are. Uh, of course, the game tokens are not your normal shoe or thimble. It's a camera, emojis, a bike, a hashtag, and sunglasses. Um, yep. 
Well, avocado toast is, quote, our fave. Ray-Bans are on fleek. That's uh, why the Ray-Bans are a piece. Tim, this sounds like you wrote it. I yeah. wish I did. I would have gotten some of the royalties. Uh, but this sounds like a very accurate depiction of millennial life, so... Forget real estate, quote, you can't afford it anyway, the board game box reads. It's all about collecting experiences by visiting the hottest destinations. <laughs> that's actually pretty, di- that's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of buying property, Jeff, you get to spend time on your friend's couch or go to a vegan bistro or a week-long meditation retreat. I think I would rather be put through a hamburger grinder than go to a vegan bistro. Would you have problem with vegan food on the whole, or is it the concept of veganism? All of it. I don't like any of it. I mean, I've been, I'm not a vegan, but I've been to vegan restaurants. They make good food. Nah, maybe they would, but I'll never know. I'm with you. Well, if, you ever, if you ever come to Toronto again, I'll take you to one. Because I, you know me, I hate that type of stuff as well. I went to one of them like on a date, and it was, it was actually really good. I didn't I know. I didn't know it wasn't meat, and like I was going on a first date, and the lady said, "Let's go to this vegan place." I said, I didn't, "You know what? Let's save our time." There was like cheese fries. Like it was like you, you would like the food there. I, I was I was shocked. I was I didn't know okay. it was vegan until I got there. It, I guess in theory there are things I know I would like that don't come from an animal. Oh yeah, sure. Like I could, but I don't need. I would just go to. I think I'm more offended by the bistro part than the vegan part. <laughs> Listen, you're I not have... in Paris. You're not on the Champs Elysees. You're in Toronto. You don't get to call yourself a bistro. Come on now. Listen, Tim. I never went back to the place. It's not like I was no. Like, I mean, like people I... like, oh, I went to Toronto to go to a bistro. Like unless you've been to France and gone on the Champs Elysees, you've been, uh, you know, maybe somewhere. Oh, in hold, hold, hold on a second. Well, you, well, you may be right. This has never stopped you before. The proclaiming things, saying I don't need to go anywhere to experience something. To experience a bistro. Yeah, check, I think you actually me. do have to. So, be so you have to go to France to experience a bistro, but for Italian food, you don't need to go to Italy. It's you can eat Jeff Boyardee. That can be imported. That can be imported. The cuisine can be imported. The bistro experience, <laughs> it, 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 it just can't. Yeah, you're, you're, re- you're really just talking yourself in circles here, pal. It's a cheap facsimile. Fourth <laughs> annual top contradiction, right there. Before yeah. we get out of here, Make before we get out of here, can I talk about one subject? Yes, go ahead. I am so frustrated with the concept of serving sizes. Who are these people to tell me what the right serving size is for anything? Everyone is different. Everyone needs a different amount of stuff. Everyone likes a different amount of stuff. For some people, a serving size is way too big. But for me, if you're telling me my service size is the size for three people, who are you to tell me that? That's what I need if I'm hungry. Um, like, I just, Tim, do, do, you, do, you, do, you no know, do you know who? Yeah, this, this is the same thing that uh, I think Jeff and I have talked about this for years. Like the biggest difference between America and the rest of the world when it comes to unhealthiness is serving size is that you just don't need that much food. You don't. Maybe I don't, but you know what? I'll decide that. Don't you try to like judge me through the ball. No, no, you know, no one is judging you. The health society is telling you you don't need this much. You are choosing to be unhealthy. You should just no, be made aware of it. They are trying to no, no. It's all a judgmental thing. It's like, oh, this no, it's not. You you just don't want to be shamed for eating an entire thing of like frosting. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't think there, I don't think that frosting comes with serving sizes. I'm talking about like some frozen like box of wings or whatever. It's like, oh, this serves four people. No, it doesn't. It serves me. That's who it serves. Yeah, but that's like talking about it in an appetizer sense, probably not in your like main course. For- well, then, then maybe that. Well, fair enough. But you know what? Then they don't know what I'm eating it for. So how the heck should they be the you know the deciders <laughs> of my fate to tell me what my serving size is? Oh, this cake serves six. No, it doesn't. It serves me, and then it serves me again tomorrow, and that's who it serves. <laughs> Like, I am so annoyed by serving sizes. Like, the world has got enough things that are screwed up in it right now. I don't need these people judging me on my food amount choices uh, from the box and from the microwave and from the label. Don't need it. Don't want it. Think it's dumb. I think we should do away with the whole serving size culture. (laughs) Because, again, for some people, a kid's meal is more than, for an adult, is all they need. For other people, they need four cheeseburgers. I mean, so who needs, honest honest to God, who needs four cheeseburgers? If you're hungry, you're hungry. Hold on, little little guys from McDonald's, I could rock three at least. Yeah, I'm not not saying that you can't eat that much. What I'm saying is, has anyone ever needed to eat four cheeseburgers at McDonald's in one second? Well, if they're hungry, they're hungry. 
I'm not in the business of judging people and telling what they need to have and what they don't. I'm telling people, you know, like a serving size to me should just mean how much you should eat until you're full. That's what a serving size is. Also, that's not how you're supposed to eat. You're supposed to give yourself a little wiggle room because your brain doesn't comprehend the fact that you're full until you're well past full. I don't care. I don't. So you just, you want, you want to be, you feel shame that you eat too much and that's a decision for me to make not for the box you you are making (laughs) it you're the one who's you're the one who's making it you just don't you know it you know it's wrong and you don't want to do it but you don't want to have to feel shame for it you don't don't want it wrong you don't want to have to do something and then live with the consequences of it no it's that i don't think that there are the consequences they think there are oh this this uh frozen lasagna he feeds a family of six no it doesn't it would feed three people if they were all like kind of full and two people yeah. if they're hungry. If they were the people from my 600 pound life, sure. No, see, they're again, factoring in, to, they're factoring in children for some of those things though, right? And like also, when they say family, si- they're factoring in like two kids or whatever. And serving size, especially on the side of a box, allows you to see how much is in the actual serving size. They're not saying that like one serving size is for like, let's say you have a bowl of cereal, but you have like a, you fill it up Instead of one cup of cereal, it's two cups of cereal. At least then you can measure what is actually going into your body by serving size. Just because it says serving size doesn't necessarily mean that you need to eat the one serving size. You can eat two of it if you want it. They're just telling you the health benefits that goes into now, one. Serving size is a racket. That's what it is. You, it just it I does it doesn't live the same truth as you, so you don't like yeah, it. It's a complete and utter racket because there are so many different people with so many different dietary needs that is it is an impossible. Tim, a dietary need is an I want to eat as much as possible until I can't stand anymore. That's all, not a dietary need. That's gluttony. And all of these things always say like recommended, like the average person's diet. So they're talking well, who about are they like to recommend all, what the, I the, eat. The, they're talking about like. Some, like a- yeah, Who are they guys. to recommend how much for me to eat? If I want to eat a whole sleeve of Oreos, I'm going to eat a whole sleeve of Oreos. If I want to eat two, because this box is supposed to feed 12 people, then I'll have two. Don't judge me. Don't tell me what my serving size should be. I'll I decide my serving size. You shouldn't be eating this. two sleeves of Oreos, Tim. I'm sorry. I'm judging you. If you're you. starving and that's all you have in the house, then that's my dinner. Go I, go I leave the house and go get that's food. What, what, okay. happened how often do you have two sleeves of Oreos for dinner? It's, 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 <laughs> It's happened with orange juice. Yes, with orange juice or oh with sparkling God. water. It's happened. Oh yeah. You know, you, 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 you built yourself a lot of credibility through the first 40 minutes of this show by being a reasonable person with reasonable takes. Now you're talking about having two sleeves of Oreos for dinner and dipping it in fucking <laughs> orange juice. It's happened. I'm not, I'm not saying I'm looking forward to ever doing it again. I'm not planning to, but it's happened. Sure. Okay. Why not? You know, it's the only thing you got in the food. It's really cold, uh, fridge or uh, cupboard or whatever. It's really cold outside. Whatever. I don't really care. Let's just eat these. And then you say, oh, well, your suggested serving size is two cookies. Find me someone on this planet who can eat two Oreos, and I'll find you a person who's lying. It's you not, can't just eat two Oreos. It, it doesn't say suggested serving size. It just says serving size. You know that, right? Yeah, well, that's the, 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 it's there because it's the suggested. So, size. so like, you oh. have de- you have decided that it is inferring something it is not, and How then chosen, you... to, and then ch- and then now you choose to be triggered by it. Three. Is this is the this is number. you. This is you living your truth more than anything I've ever heard of. No, it's not my truth. It's I think that it's impossible to know what a proper serving for everybody is, and because it's so generic, just do away with it. Just if you want to give health benefits for how many grams of sugar or carbs, whatever, do it on a gr- one unit basis or do it on a hundred gram basis. Just find some. That's, neutral what, the, that's, base. What, that's what the serving size is. You just go look but, at it. When you look no at it, when you look of two cookies, no one's ever had a serving of two Oreos. No one on God's green earth. You, you realize that if you have four, Oreos. you can just double that. Right. But. Then that's making me feel like you ate twice as many as you should. Not as many people are triggered by the side of a box like you are. You you are feeling no. It's just because you're at a line and feeling shame because of it. That's the only reason you care. You shouldn't feel you shouldn't feel guilty. Enjoy what you enjoy. Yeah, just be just be. They're just trying to let you be conscious of the fact that you're making you're taking on a lot of calories. You don't have to feel guilt if it's you've welcomed heart disease into your body. Is Fine. See, there you go. You, again. you can I choose to do whatever like, you want. Like fun size chocolate bars. Yeah, yeah I, I, I love this. <laughs> I think I, I I don't even know. Like I can, might be right. He might be wrong. He's not right. This is crazy wrong. talk. No, 
<laughs> he's obviously wrong, but I, I am just obsessed. I can't wait to go back and listen to the start of this, that you are so worked up over what the box says, as if that applies to you, like a, a, a man and what he wants for dinner is, is absurd to me that, that this has gotten to you and you can't see past why it's even there, why they would write it. Just behavior control. I don't like it. How often do you get meals that are, that say can serve six people and then you eat it for yourself? I don't know. It happens. Definitely with like pizzas or like frozen things. How many frozen things come to the say they can feed six people? Lasagnas, uh, you know, chicken pot pies, uh, you know, shepherd's pies, you know, stuff like that. You know, Look, all this are is... you just like sad that you're alone? <laughs> that's no, that's very no. interesting. No, no. Because, because no, I'm just saying like, you're like, yeah, it's all for me. It says it serves six, but I'm going to eat this much now. I'm going to put it in the fridge and eat the rest later. But they're not telling you you shouldn't eat the rest. They're trying to control how much I should be. Uh, well, we think it would be best for you if you just ate one eighth of this meatloaf instead of the entire thing. It's not well, you telling know you that. You know what it, do you know what it is telling you? It's telling you how much of everything you need. Vitamins, calories, I don't fat, know. sugar. I don't want to know. Then don't fucking look at it. But it's right there glaring at me. I yeah, know it's I, there. It's something that I like to look at. Because I like to try to parse out how much I'm eating every day. And you can absorb more calorie and more food than I can during the course of the day because you're bigger than I am. You're taller than I am. You're bigger than I am. I would just, on average, would have to eat fewer calories than you per day to just get my natural, healthy self going. Like well, I, I guess the thing is, if they could make serving sizes that were tailored to me personally. Yeah, and I'd you'd still go it. over it because you don't want to be told what to do. I don't know. I, I guess that's the end of my rant here. I'll give you one I, thing, Tim. So on this one frozen pizza company, they do say, like, their, their serving size is one quarter. It's just like, why don't you just tell people what's in the entire pizza? I think exactly. I believe no, it, don't make people I, I believe do the it math. is standardized to try to get to, like, the, like, to the same amount of grams or whatever unit that they're – it's going to be grams that they're using. Like, how much of a thing is in a serving? And I think that's dictated. So it can be ubiquitous across the board for different styles of food. Like, if you have one pizza place, that's – because it just becomes confusing to people that if you didn't do it by one-fourth of a pizza, and the, one of the other ones said, you know, in the one serving that we're counting as a serving is the entire pizza, people will look and be like, what the fuck is going on? That if you can standardize it, it makes it easier. Tim, don't you remember this from the European pillars of the European Union class? I do. I remember them measuring how much curvature there is in a banana and how many milliliters are in a tube of uh, toothpaste and all that stuff. Yeah, so, so, for instance, this pizza has... Uh... Yeah, forty six percent of your daily fat, but it says fourteen percent because it cuts it into six percent. Yeah, for a full pizza. Yeah, forty six percent, as if they know what my percentage should be. <laughs> yeah, that's based on somebody who consumes two thousand calories a day. That's what it all. It's for the average person. Some people are going to be more. Well, nervous. I'm not an average person. No, but yeah, I mean, you may be twenty five hundred calories for a maintenance type of level. But I'm yeah. me. But yeah, then you, you then just you want to eat like a slob there. and not feel bad about it. No, that's not what this is. It's not about that, my private grievances. Oh, oh, really? Really? That's not what this is about? I'm just annoyed, and I just wanted to make this point because I felt like people aren't hearing this enough, and I'm here to stand up for the average man who probably feels the exact same way I do. Jeff, how, where, where do you weigh in on this? Jeff's gone. I think Jeff's gone. Yeah, Jeff went and made himself an entire pizza. <laughs> He's going to eat one he fourth was, of it. Oh, he was humored by it, um, but he's absolute. I was humored by it, but he's absolutely nuts. Like I, I could imagine, like that could be I, the that that by the way could be the tagline for this whole sh- series. No, but uh, like I imagine, like me in university, like making a frozen pizza and like mocking that it says it's oh it's supposed to serve four. I'm gonna eat this whole box, or me and my roommate like eating a whole tray of chicken fingers. Like I don't know, it says it's for seven people. Well, there's two of us, and we're going to eat it all. Um, no one cares. No one's offended. Anyway, thought we should go out on a happy note, because I was thinking about this. Well, I'm going to give you some time back, and you can go cook 87 chicken wings and eat them all in one sitting and then not feel bad Thank about goodness. it. Thank goodness. Tim needs to entertain himself while he's microwaving his chicken wings. He's reading the side of the box, feeling sad. 
It, yeah, it just comes down that you're getting Bach shamed. I will not be shamed. Well, it sounds like you're allowing yourself to be shamed. You could just not pay attention to it. Sometimes it's good to be a little shamed. Oh, yeah, yeah. A little bit of shame never hurt anyone, did it? Maybe it's Can I make a suggestion that's going to, like, really annoy Tim? Sure. For the corona world? Um, so, like, historically, well, regularly I have to get, like, blood taken because of some health stuff earlier in my life. That's all cleared and perfect, but it, it makes me have to get blood taken, which is healthy because now my doctor can see, you know, when anything comes up because I'm taking blood regularly. Yada, yada, yada. When I have to get my blood taken um, at the places that I go, I can, like, book a time. So if there's like eight people in line that didn't book a time, I show up on my time, I go to the front of the line. It's just how it works. They have an online system. I believe I, this might not, this will anger Tim and it might not affect him because he doesn't live in like a populace like we do, Pat. But I believe I should be able to book my time to go to the store. Yeah, the problem- In this world- it, 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 a, lot of, a lot of places you can do that for though. Like- uh, for pickups, like at the place that uh, my wife and I ate at the other night, like they have pickup times. They're not doing delivery. You okay, can go- food food pickup, I think that's a great idea for like the curbside food. But I'm talking about like I want to go to the, the Walmart or the Target. I don't want to wait in a line around Which the corner. I've got an order. I got to go pick up here in a moment. I want to book that I'm going to, I if there's a slot available in the amount of people allowed or they only allow X amount of slots to get booked because they're obviously still going to allow foot traffic in um you know the people that didn't uh i i just want to be able to book my time when i want to go to the drugstore or the stores or even the grocery stores i i want to see that i i think if, that in that extent. that in theory that idea works out really well but i think in practice there aren't enough people who would potentially have access to book this stuff so then they're absolutely oh. shut out of the entire process there's other people yeah, that would just forget fuck. to do it and then like they would need something like if you're dealing with essential things like drugstores groceries that sort of thing i just don't think you can pull that off yeah. yeah. See, I was thinking like a fast pass, like at the amusement parks, but you are right. It's not fair for me to go to Walmart and like bypass the line, but you know, the lady might not have internet. Yeah. You, you, you sort of made me see how I'm wrong. Or it'd be even something like my grandma where she has the internet, but I have no fucking clue how to do that. Fair enough. But like I said, like my parents, like this whole food delivery thing, like all these things that Tim got mad when Corona started, like everything he hated was kind of being expediated by this. Oh yeah. Um, mobile I, I, ordering all that. Like uh, they're going to like stick to a lot of their mobile habits that they certainly probably never would have developed. Like yeah. unless they were home stricken as they got older, older. Yeah. Like the, uh, the tech curve has really gone up for old people. Like they, they're not, I mean, Tim is still afraid to use the internet, but like older people who were just not fluent in tech and like ordering stuff or Amazon. I just use the internet to make an order for something. I have to go pick up. There you go. Have you, have you ordered anything off Amazon yet? No. Have you, but I just ordered it. I just ordered it. No. So even you're doing it like you're the classic. I mean, you identify as a boomer. So this is, but I just ordered a pizza that I have to go pick up. There you go. And you're going to eat the entire thing and get triggered. It said it was for, no, five I'm not going to eat the entire you, thing, but would you get on Papa it? John's? We gets that garlicky stuff to put on the, uh, yeah. to put on the crusts. Would you get on it? Yeah. What like, kind of pizza? The, did you uh, get? What topics? I, I got, a, I got a works. I right, see. I like the works. The works is probably my favorite kind of pizza. It's up there. I've been like crushing them. barbecue chicken pizza. Nah, I don't from... go in for those ones. I, I mean, it's them. it's fine. It's like having chicken on nachos. Like, I don't want chicken on my pizza. I don't want chicken on my nachos. Like, I just, what about our friend who has nachos with just I chicken agree. and cheese? That that that's no, fuck that, that, that. I don't mind. Like, I can have nachos with chicken on them if everything else is on them. But yeah, we have a friend who gets nachos, cheese, and chicken. Like, that's disgusting. <laughs> I like that. that that's appeals it though. To me. No salsa. That's it. <laughs> oh, okay. No, I, mm, I'd eat it, but it would taste plain. But I wouldn't mind it. And of all the nachos that you could get, that would be your preference? No, but I would still like, I, I would eat it. I don't know. Sure. I I, I, I'm not saying that I wouldn't eat it, but it's like the driest thing in the world. Like, give me some salsa. Give me a whole bunch of veggies on it. Like that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, what is your preferred pizza meat? If you can only have one meat on your pizza, what would it be? Pepperoni. Yeah, pepperoni. It's like the state. It's. 
Yeah, it's, is is that's the staple. I, I, I would. I mean, it's the most common, obviously. Uh, I think I would go. So I really like sausage on pizza. Yeah, that would probably be okay. Separate. Yeah, that would be. They're kind of in the same family. Pepperoni is just like a fan. It's. Fa- yeah. I mean, sausage is like fancier. If you're like, you know. I agree completely. I, I feel like sausage is easier to distribute on a pizza slice and across a pizza than pepperoni. Because if you order a pizza inherently, a few of the slices are going to have like more clumps of pepperoni on it. Or even if you buy a frozen pizza that's pepperoni, like you kind of have to move the pepperoni around or add the pepperoni to it. With sausage, where it's like smaller chunks, that doesn't seem to be as big of a problem. Yeah, that that's all true. But we got real is better with pepperoni a little bit so that's why i say it but i agree with you pretty much uh down the line there we got real good pizza joints in this town and uh, you don't need to get papa john's well to me that's a pizza joint and i'm looking forward to this yeah there's some like especially where you're at like east coast pizza is excellent that's like the antithesis of east coast pizza i like chains that should surprise nobody but you like Domino's. like Domino's is better love Domino's. though i like papa john's now too why do you like Papa John so much? Because because they have this stuff you put on your crust that's got this. Anyway, it's really good. All I know is uh, right, but like a month or two before Corona, everyone was making fun of the Papa John's guy for eating thirty pizzas in thirty days, and I'm telling you, that doesn't seem so crazy anymore. It seems crazy not to. Yeah, but of course, his ser- serving size is one slice of pizza a day. I'm sure. What you don't, you have the freedom, Tim. That's still within your control. That you can go over that if you want to. Well, I intend to. And you will. Then you'll be mad about it. Probably. There you go. All right. Tim, Jeff, thank you all for being here. Again, smash the like button for the episode. Leave a five-star review on the Pat Mayo Experience. Follow me at the PME, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. If you want to watch all of the previous Cuss Corners, hit the description of this podcast or video. They're all on demand for free up there right now. All right? Tell some friends, too. Everyone loves a Cuss Corner. I'm Pat Mayo. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time. Experience! Experience!